Okay, so today we're doing the most fun lecture of the year, jargon. And I've been waiting for this. Um, we're going to launch Clickers on Friday, so with Clickers is always a problem with people like not registering and stuff, that sort of thing. So I'm, on Friday I'll have time to debug after class, so that way we don't get points. We can fix that. Okay. Um, there's a question posted to the anonymous feedback site about what sort of questions I'll ask with Clickers. So there's a simple Clicker question here, which we'll get to. Um, but you know, very basic information about the, your critter of the week, of the, of the day, as well as past lectures, okay? As well as questions like the one we talked about today, where it's just like, are you alive? Two points, okay? Basic, you try to get audience feedback, okay? So, we'll figure out what this bird is doing in a few minutes. Okay. <coughs> All right, so learning objectives for today, right? So, precise language is essential to science. Okay, why bother learning jargon? You can, can't say, the thing does the thing to the thing. And so it gets thingy. And, and you know, that's difficult to use for communication. Okay? People, get, people get into intense arguments about words in science. Okay? Um, so we're going to learn and discuss particular vocabulary useful the rest of the year. Okay? So what I'm doing is not just teaching you all the jargon we have in macroevolution. I think stuff will keep coming up again and again. No. Okay. So first of all, what is a species? What do you think a species is? Okay, with, with each other. Okay. What about asexual species? Organisms. Species is a hard, hard, hard concept, which is why I'm, I'm pushing it on. Yeah. Someone else. What else do you think a species is? Fuzzy, fuzzy kinds of lots of arguments. Okay, so, so the definition you gave was the, the, the one, the interbreeding is probably like the standard definition, which is good. So, uh, so here's a list of possible species definitions. People put it out with literature. Okay, you don't need to learn all of these. Okay, um, the one that we'll probably use in this class most is biological species. So she was saying they're interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups, okay? <coughs> um, but there's many, many different concepts here, right? So Aaron's talking about sort of phylogenetic species, right? Um, so the lineage on a tree, okay? When we get into paleontology, think about chronospecies, right? So if a single lineage, imagine like, hum you know, if there are only one human population through time, um, at what point do you say, okay, that's now not, no longer Homo erectus, now it's Homo sapiens, right? Um, and actually, humans were a bush through our history, but you know, we're going aside. <coughs> so there are many species concepts. There's some people who say that there are no species. This is an arbitrary rank. Okay, so I'll use species, the word species. I'll think about species when I'm thinking about species. I'm thinking about biological species. Okay, but note that there are many, many definitions. Okay, and so if you're in the business of, you know, naming things into species, you have to be clear what you're what you're thinking about. Any questions about this? Okay. All right, speciation. So one train of thought was thinking about speciation in its geographic context. Okay. So allopatry, different countries. Um, sympatry, same countries. Tripatry in the middle. All right. Why do we care about geography of speciation? So go back to her definition of like, you know, interbreeding organisms. How is this different from this? Yep. Right. 
So this, they, they can't integrate here. So you can imagine them evolving traits that, you know, at some point now, if they did come back together, they couldn't integrate anymore, right? Whereas here, you know, even though they couldn't integrate with everyone else, at some point they stopped, right? So it's speciation and basic gene flow, and here we have lack of gene flow and then speciation. Okay. <coughs> Which is more common, do you think? Alcatry? Alcatry? Okay, why do you say why do people say that? You're right. So, so this is a, a test bias, which is the acetamin bias we were talking about last time. So there's that case. I would argue that, in fact, actually allocatric speciation happens more even when we account for that. Um, but it's good to think about the biases. Um, yeah? Uh, you assume that sexual differences are Mm-hmm. Why is that? Yep. So it's you're almost almost correct. So um, deleterious mutations are more likely to establish, but neutral mutations are equally likely. Yeah. Um, so mutations are introduced at a rate. You know, this is the pure individual mutation rate, and here's population size. And what's the rate at which mutations leave? by genetic drift. Remember this from bio 130 or the equivalent? This is cool. It's really cool. Okay. The rate which they leave is 1 over n. So the number of substitutions you have in the population is I'm making this many, and this many is sort of persist, and so I get mu. Yeah. So under neutrality, if there's no selection, the number of mutation, mutations that become fixed in the population is just the mutation rate. It's kind of cool. And you note that population size drops out. So that's independent of population size. It's kind of cool. Um, <coughs> so you know, big populations won't affect the actual number of mutations. Now we have selection happening. Selection is more, more effective when you have bigger population size. And so if there are some mutations that are deleterious, so for example, when you're going from here to here, at some point, you know, the purple ones have fewer, off, have fewer opportunities to make them the yellow ones, right? So it might be some sort of deleterious where you know, yellow can make with everyone, purple can make with some things. That might have fewer offspring. It might, be, it might be a valley, an adaptive valley. And so it could be that you can go through it more easily in a small population size. Okay. That's good. Um, <coughs> and so this question of Geography of speciation is interesting because you care about um, what sort of processes lead to the speciation. We'll get to some of them later on. Okay? But the reason we care about it is just, it's interesting to think about what's happening in the presence of gene flow versus absence of gene flow. Okay? As Katie said, we have very few examples of some type of speciation. So this took us out of palms, right? We used to think that there were sticklebacks, we found out there was a sort of allopatry there. Um, so we have very, very few cases of synthetic speciation. We're good. So we'll get back. Any, any questions about speciation? Okay. Okay. So phylogenetics, just the jargon for phylogenetics. So here we have. Here I have one population of individuals. So males are black circles, females are white. And they're interbreeding, having offspring, having offspring, having offspring. <coughs> Mountain range appears, speciation event, and separate. Okay? And so we represent this on a tree as saying population A becomes B and C. Okay? 
So we have just these simple lines that reflect this underlying history of populations. Okay. Now, are these so-called good species? We don't know. So it's possible we could take the those individuals we see and then mate happily and have fertile offspring. Okay. This is not making a statement about that. But all it is making a statement that these are now separate lineages. Okay. And presumably with time, that evolves traits that make them so they can't interbreed. Okay, just by chance. Now we can make a diagram of several such populations, right? So one population split into two, okay. and then this one splits into two more, and so forth. Why do we keep having splitting this in two? Why not split into three at once, or four? change. Sort of, sort of, so, I mean, I like where you're going with this, so you can think about, like, yeah, you know, there could be changes happening along here, but then the only, the only, the basic changes you have is the mountain region separating them. Um, almost there. So basically it comes back to the process of speciation. Right? So speciation is rare, and we think it happens, you know, one becoming two, typically rather than one becoming three at the exact same instant. Okay? If it were exact, the exact same instant, it would be one becoming three. But if it happens just a little bit offset, one, two, and then splitting again. All right, so very short branch here, okay, but still dichotomous. Okay. So this case where it actually becomes three at once is known as a hard polytome. So anything that has more than two branches is called a polytomy. Um, is that two? And this is called a hard polytomy, means it's actually, you know, no matter how much data you have, you can't resolve that. That's actually what happened. Right? With something like this, well, it could be this tree, it could be, you know, you flip this taxon, this taxon. Right? It's hard to tell. All, all we have information for that is whatever changes happened right here on that internode. Okay? So if we're doing, trying to analyze the tree, we have trouble separating that. So it would be a soft polytoming. But with enough data, in theory, you can separate it. Okay? Um, questions about that? I see puzzled looks. You can just say, huh, slow down, uncle. Yeah. OK. So what we try to do is we, have, we take data and try to infer what a tree is from the data. Okay. So let's say we have three species, A, B, C. Right? And I want to know how they're related. They can be related this way. Or they can be related this way. Or what's the third way? Excellent. Or in theory, if the species was happening exactly simultaneously. Now, in practice, we think this is too rare. We think, okay, this didn't happen. So it's one of these three. Okay? Well, which one is it? How can you tell? What, what evidence could you bring to bear on it? Mm -hmm. What about morphology? And say, okay, actually, A and B are both woody and C is herbaceous. 
A and B both drop their leaves, C doesn't. A and B both make apple-like fruits, and C makes um, like some arrows, like, like maple fruits. Okay? <coughs> now, use some evidence that A and B are a sister to each other. Okay? Now, of course, the three species actually, the energy case, it's, the three species is actually too simple to get for this. Okay? But you get the idea. You look at these shared traits, shared drive traits. Right. Now, if this branch is really short, there isn't enough time to evolve, change of woodiness, and change of fruit. Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe change for just you know one small change in mitochondria. Right? And so until you find that change, you, you, all these trees are really, really good. Because so you have lots and lots of data, like the whole genome. You find that, oh, look, there's a change. Right? And so you might find a little evidence of, oh, is this true? Right? But <coughs> until you get that. All you know is that it's one of these trees, you don't know which one it is. And so you call that a soft polytone. And so the way you represent that is as that. You have no, no resolution. And then everyone who knows who you saw would say, oh, they have no clue. So what's the thing? I don't know. So you might know the rest of the tree really well. You might know D and E and then F. You might know that really well, you just might know A, B, and C. In the same way we could know, you know, much of the mammal tree, but not know whether, you know, chimps or gorillas are human sister species. Yeah. Actually, chimps and bonobos, right? <coughs> so, we're going to do that in the soft polytone. Then we're actually, let's do an event that has two species for development, it's a hard polytone. We really don't think those happen much. Okay. Other questions about this? So here's another possible way of looking at a tree. Okay, something we don't present much anymore, um, <coughs> but it's as a series of nestings. Okay, and that's what a tree is—a series of nestings, right? So if you imagine if you took this tree and then started looking at it from above, what you'd see is this. Okay. Um, but you don't present it this way because you lose information about like how long these time periods are. But it does tell you something about the nest. So here you might think, you know, you're all used to these trees. We'll get back to this in a minute of like, you know, all these things leading up to humans. Like kind of right? <coughs> well, with this, it's always you know pinnacle, right? A bunch of nesting groups. Okay. And with this, same thing, no pinnacle, so much of nesting groups. It's easier to see here. Right? This a tree is a series of nestings. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so more jargon, and you'll hear me say this a lot because I study phylogenetics, I use it as a way to understand map evolution, mm -hmm. so I get excited about this. So I talk about it a lot. So, no um, if you call it a tree, it's called, also call it a phylogeny, a cladogram, it has no branch lengths, so a diagram of clades, or if you're a mathy person, a connected graph with no cycles. Okay, if you're not a mathy person, you can ignore that. But what no cycles means is no articulation, right? So every every node has just one parent node. Okay. I don't have hybridization events where something has two parents. Okay, we have that, but it's not technically a tree. Any questions? Okay. So the thingy at the tip, we can call it a taxon. We call it operational taxon unit, taxonomic unit, OTU. We call it a leaf, which is a sort of mathy term. We call it a terminal or a terminal node. Okay. Now note that taxa are often exit organisms, but they don't, they don't have to be. Okay. So fossils can be taxa on a tree. Right? So fossils don't occur here on the tree. Fossils are taxa in their own right. right? They can be on the chips, but just you know, back in time. Um, Viruses are sampled different times. So we can look at the course of an HIV infection in humans and sample viruses every few months and see how they change. Uh, flu viruses spreading through the population. You can see, looking at the branch lines, how much the flu has evolved through time. Okay? So they keep sending different points in time. They're not ancestral to each other necessarily, but they're on a tree. Okay? So not all tests need to be at the same time on a tree. Okay, this line thingy is a branch or an edge. 
Okay. No, it's a, no, it's a single. It doesn't go all the way down to the root. It's just this edge. Okay. It may have length. Net length can correspond to time, amount of character change, probability of character change, and so forth. Why do we want to have that? Yeah, so if you measure it in time, it gives us information, right? The humans separate from the Chimpanoba lineage, you know, a thousand years ago, five million years ago, a hundred million years ago. That's interesting, right? What was going on then? Was climate drying out, right? Um, those sort of questions can, you can get at from these branch length estimates. Okay. Amount of change can be interesting too. So if we think that, <coughs> you know, these are evolving into a new area, right? Maybe they have lots of changes there. So, oh, look, the rate of evolution is much, much, much faster there. If you evolve into it, okay. So we answer questions like that. Okay, this where, where nodes, where edges meet, is called a node, internal node. Okay. More fun jargon. Um, if we have just two descendant branches, so no polytomies, it's bifurcating or fully resolved or dichotomous. All right, so those of you who use dichotomous keys to key out taxa, it's the same sort of diagram. Okay? If you do a red-black red, uh, red search algorithm for sorting, it's, it's this sort of dichotomous tree, too. Those of you in computer science, which I don't think anyone is, actually. Um, you know, so we also have polytomies or multicotomies. Okay? The term most commonly used is polytomy. Okay. And in most phylogenetic inference, we're trying to get the tree, we want to get a tree that has uh, this dichotomous, no polytomies. Okay, polytomies means lack of information. For scientists, we abhor that. Okay, the root. Okay, so the root's a node. Okay, it's at the bottom of the tree. Okay, so a rooted tree is the most common tree you'll see in this class and in life. And this node is known as the most recent common ancestor or for math people, the least common ancestor of all the taxa. So this shows the direction of time, right? So this node, the speciation event, happens after the speciation event. OK? Now here's an important term you'll see coming up again and again. Clade. Who can, who can point to a clade on this tree? It's an ancestor in all its descendants. Mm -hmm. So this and so it's not space is probably the node, it's probably the node in the sentence, right? So maybe this node and all these taxa. Yeah, that would be good. good. So for example, here's a clade, just like that one. Okay. Here also is a clade. Right? It's a node in all of the sentence, even though we have just one on the tree. Okay? So you can think about having those ancestors. So this, there's an ancestor on this branch, right? If you don't sample it, but it's there. And so that ancestor, in all sense, is also in play. Okay. And here's another one. Okay. And note some ambiguity. So this is a clay, but so is this one. Right? So the same tip, tip taxa, right? But this clay includes all these ancestors, and the previous one didn't. Okay, so even though they have the same tip, tip taxa, they're different clades. Okay. A paraphyletic group, bad. So, <coughs> an ancestor in some, but not all of us descendants. Yeah. So for the So it has so one clade for it is this clade, one clade for it is this clade, one clade for it is this clade. And the page for it is this entire. Yep. Yeah. Question. So it could be that there, like, it could be, that, you know, so we have a speciation event and we have these populations through time. It's possible at the present we only have these five. It's possible we've had no more than five lineages at any point in time, but we know that there were populations all through here. Right. 
And so those are those good potential ancestors. Answer the question. But they still belong in the same. Wait. They, the same lineage. So, but you're not suggesting that there are other species that are similar. No, there's no there's report. No report. Yeah. Yeah. So even though there's no other species events, it's still it's still has an ancestral population. Okay. Now, it's a good concern, though, because in actuality, there could be speciation myths that we don't see. That some species and then goes extinct, or we don't go sample in Syria, so it's not on our tree. Right? This is a very important source of bias. And some of the methods we're going to talk about can really be thrown off by that sort of bias. This could be cautious about that. That's great. You guys are really thinking well. Too. That's fine. Okay, so, paraphyletic group. Bad. Okay, why bad? <clears throat> It's not only information. What do you mean? Right. Yep. What were you going to say? Mm Right, and it's, it's argued it doesn't predict other things, right? So if I know that this is a clade, like if I know if this is a clade, and I know that then I know they share, they share all this history, right? And so I can predict things based on all that shared history, right? Whereas this one, they share history, but share history with this thing is not in the clade, and it's hard to predict what's going to be in that. Okay, um, and it's also hard to communicate science and communicate the tree. Who can think of some paraphletic groups? Herpetology. Right. So herpetology, study of reptiles, right? And some amphibians. Why are reptiles not a clade? Right. Right. So if you think of the reptile tree, um, Lizards and in lizards, there are snakes and also skinks. Um, and then we have crocodilians, right? And then we had dinosaurs, and among dinosaurs are birds. Right? And so if I take reptiles as the set of things that are scaly, like, you know, covered eggs that don't need to be in water, right? Will ignore his birds, which are part of that group, right? part of that overall clay. Okay. <coughs> and so there are things like, you know, crocodilians have a four chambered heart. Birds have a four chambered heart, right? So if you don't remember that they're clay, you might say, oh, huh, it's interesting that like four chambered heart evolved separately in birds and crocodilians. Well, actually, they're just involved in their ancestor, and they possess the same four chambered heart, right? I don't know if they actually did, if they re evolved it. But I mean that's the thing you, you lose by talking about things that aren't clades. What else is a paraphletic group? Fish. Fish. Fire fish paraphletic group. Right, so they include hitchopods. Right, so if you think a shark's a fish and a trout's a fish, well you're more closely related, related to a trout than a trout's related than um, a shark is. Right? You share all that history. Okay, so fish are a paraphyletic group, right? So shark, trout, you. Sometimes we want to keep clade names. So we want, like, we want to, so we don't, let's say we, we like to name fish. Right? Fish is a useful term. We want to only name clades. What could you do? Bony, bony fish. Yeah. 
So you can say bony fish, right? Might be this. Okay, and then exclude. And then sharks aren't a fish, and you're not a fish. Okay, or you could extend the group. So then sharks are fish, trout are fish, and whales are fish. So we'll do tetrapods. Right? So those are the moves you can do. <laughs> or you can just do the mental air quotes. Right? Um, <coughs> which, you know, people don't like to do in science, right? Because um, it communicates this thing that's not quite accurate. Because people think, oh, you know, trout are similar to sharks when actually they share this history with you more than they share with sharks. Okay? Those are sort of approaches you can do with that. Okay, polyphytic group, even worse. So, some, typically in classes like this, they have you define paraphytic versus polyphyletic. Okay, um, I'm not going to bother with that because I think the, the distinction is sort of arbitrary. Right, so here's a polyphytic group. Okay, so now it doesn't include the ancestor. Right? But it's still the same number of taxa as in the paraphytic group. Right, so which is the paraphytic, polyphytic, polyphytic group? We would typically <coughs> define it based on Tip tax that you're currently told apart. So I'm not going to bother with that distinction here. Okay. Any questions about this? Yeah. Um, would you have like a polyphyletic group? Um, carnivores. Like not carnivora, but things that eat meat. That'd be a polyphyletic group. Okay. Um, it's things that typically are defined by like a single trait. Flying things, polyphyletic so group. We, so you I mean, it depends on the context. If you're, if you're doing, like, ecology, you want to say, you know, these things are animals of the tundra, it's a polyphyletic group, but sure, talk, talk about them. But don't talk about them as, as sort of like a natural group. Okay. Right, they're just... I think Yeah, so like things that are at a certain trophic level. That's not a clade, but still use, useful to talk about. Okay. Yeah. Um, animals of the Cretaceous. Yeah, I mean, you can, it's, it's not like swearing. You can say that these things, you know. <laughs> no, you said reptiles. <laughs> out. Um, but it's good to be thoughtful about what you're doing and not just naming reptiles as a group without being careful about that. Yeah. Just like etiquette. Etiquette, and when it comes to actually naming things, it's sort of the rule, though it's unofficial, but you get, you get to beat down if you violate it. <coughs> Taxonomists are a funny bunch. Um, other questions? Okay. So where would a genus be on this tree? <clears throat> yep. So species, I mean, there's an argument about what their species are, but there's something about like inbreeding and that sort of thing. But genus, family, order, all that stuff. You know, how, how do you find it, right? So humans, we're the genus Homo, right? And we're in the, I think, the family Hominidae, right? So we have, you know, one species has all these ranks, whereas Astragalus has like 400 species in one genus, right? So in, oftentimes in ecology or even paleontology, you'll compare number of genera here versus here, right? It could be people here like to split things up, and people here like to lump things. It's going to be arbitrary based on how people, people put things into, how people classify things. Right? <coughs> um, so that's something to watch out for. So there are ways to get around that using phylogenies and like figuring out how much evolutionary history is here versus here and that sort of thing. But you should be cautious about using ranks themselves to compare things. Okay. We'll come back to that later. Okay. Um, and there's also now a fight in taxonomy over naming systems. Some people think you should only na you should name you keep keep using these ranks. Some people think you sh you, you shouldn't. You can just name clades that are important, right? So if I said to you mammals, what rank is mammals? Class. Good. How about angiosperms? They're they're between the ranks. Right? So it's a huge important group. Flowering plants. What rank are they? Yeah, they're between the ranks, right? And so. So we'll say you can just name things that way, not have to bother remembering that mammals are a class. Right? The counter-argument is that if know something's in class mammalia, then no, it's not in class, I don't know, Pinaceae, if Pinaceae is a class. Right? So you know these classes are non-overlapping. Right? But other than that, it sort of misleads you about like their equal age or something like that. They might not be. Okay. 
Okay. So in this class, I won't emphasize ranks at all. So if you're learning a taxon, I don't care if you know, you know, what family it is. I just care if you know that it's, you know, an orchid. Right? Orchids are family. Orchidaceae. Um, or orchid. Or orchidae. Orchidaceae. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So we have a bunch of plant taxonomists and fungal taxonomists who know the taxonomy better than I do. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> but you see, I'm a social scientist and I don't know what class or what level orchids are. So you can be too. Um, okay, so we can't compare genera, so what can you compare? Sister groups. Okay. If we were going to name them today, we probably could say sibling groups rather than the gendered term, but we're stuck with this one. So sister groups. Okay. So <coughs> a pair of clades is sitting from the same node. Why are they good to compare? <coughs> right. So they're the same thing all the way back from this time up to this point, right? And then they diverge, and then if one gets one trait, you can see how that affects things, right? It's like doing those studies with identical twins, right? I have a bunch of identical twins. I teach this half to smoke, that half not to smoke. Right? What happens to them? Well, for each pair, I know they're the same genetically, and then I separate them in one starts smoking, one doesn't. Let's see what happens, okay? So we do the same thing here. One evolves latex canals, one doesn't. What happens next? One learns to eat meat, one doesn't. What happens next? Okay? This is a very common technique. Okay? The problem is it doesn't give you a lot of power, right? So I can have this be clade of a thousand species, right? And I compare this versus this one comparison. Okay. So that's a sister group. That's also a sister group. Okay. And this is also a sister group. Okay. So sister groups don't have to have the same number of attacks in them. Most interesting when they don't. Okay. But they did have a shared ancestor. Okay. okay, so rooting. We talked about how trees need a root. Oh, trees can have a root, right? The most recent common ancestor of all the taxa. And that gives us direction of the trees. We know which way is up, which way is towards the present. We also going also to have unrooted trees. Okay, so this tree, we don't know where the ancestor is. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here, many places. Okay, now this matters if you're trying to think about how traits have evolved. Okay, <coughs> so for example, here, if the root is here, root in one, we have this tree. So what we do is grab the tree, pull it down by that new root, and get this. So we have root 5, put it here, and pull it down here. Why does this matter? Well, one story in ant evolution is we think it started out as very small, sort of a queen and her kids, and then but you got big colonies. Okay. But with this rooting, it implies that many of uh, the, the ancestral state would be large colonies. And then eventually you go to small colonies. So it completely reverses the order of evolution. So you get an idea about evolutionary processes just based on rebooting the tree. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? We're going to cover phylogenetics on Friday, um, which is awesome. But so we'll get back to this. But that'll be more about using trees. Okay. So characters, mm -hmm. homology. So similarity due to shared ancestry, right? So humans, birds, and turtles all have four limbs. Okay. And then we have homoplasy. Similarity, but not due to shared ancestry. Okay. So we have convergence of dolphins and ichthyosaurs on the same shape. Okay. So when we're building trees, we like to use homology, not homoplasy, right? This could mislead us. You might think, oh, you know, dolphins and ichthyosaurs are sister species. And actually, they're not. This is more closely related to a to a um, uh, those uh, lizards. Uh, well, in general, more really closely related to lizards in general. Okay. <coughs> Whereas these are more closely related to hippos. Okay. But this, this, they share these features 
mislead us. Okay. On the other hand, hopefully this is a good argument for converge for natural selection. Right? So I have I take a lizard and I take a cow, stick them in the water, let them evolve for a while, what do I get? I get the same shape. Right? The strong argument that this same shape is adaptive. Okay. Okay. More jargon. Plesiomorphy. An ancestral state with reference to another derived state. Okay. Symplesiomorphy, shared by two or more taxa. Okay. Apomorphy, in a derived state, with reference to another ancestral state. Synapomorphy, shared by two or more taxa. And ought apomorphy by one taxa. Okay. So example of the first. So sharks live in water, tetrapods live on land. Right? So the ancestral home for vertebrates is the water. So for sharks, that's a plesiomorphy, something they possess from the ancestor. Okay. Apomorphy, whales living in water compared to other tetrapods. Okay? So tetrapods evolved on land, whales went back into the water. So the state here isn't, so here it's both water, right? But here it's relative to a more derived state living on land, as well as to the born, to another derived state. Or another ancestral state. Okay, so the, the direction of change that matters. Okay. Now, the, the easiest way to fail the ta the class is by saying taxons. There are no taxons in this class. There are taxa. You won't actually fail, probably. Okay. <coughs> All right. So here we see a bird walking around. So what, what do you think it's doing? Fishing, right? And so those of you who go boating, you can know there's a glare, right? And you can't see well through the glare. So what it does is cover the water to hide the glare. Okay? So does that mean wings evolved for glare covering? No. Right? Wings evolved for some other purpose, and they were adapted to this purpose. Okay? And so <coughs> adaptation is when something's shaped for its current use. Right? So the dorsal fin in a dolphin evolved to help give it stability in the water. Okay? So it's a nice adaptation. Okay? But also we've seen evolution in lots of cases where things are sort of co-opted for other purposes. Okay? And like everything in evolution, this is a fuzzy line, so it's not like a good, oh, you must be, adapt you must be adaptation. Okay? <coughs> um, but if it's something shaped by natural reflection for some purpose and it's used for something else, it's called adaptation. Um, <coughs> we can think of examples of this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So pandas are this carnivore that evolved to eat grass. And the grass that often all dies out after flowering. Really, anyway, so they have um, a gut that's too short, this sort of evolving to become longer. But also to hold bamboo, they don't have a thumb. Okay, they originally they had you know five parallel digits. And what they've done is evolved sort of a sixth digit out of a wrist bone. Okay, so you can imagine. I mean, the wrist bone didn't evolve to become to be a thumb, right? But it was co-opted into a thumb. Okay, feathers is a nice example, right? So we know that dinosaurs evolved feathers before they could evolve flight. Right? So it wasn't like they said, oh, you know what would be great in a few million years? Flying. Let's get started on that now. You know? <coughs> no. They said, I'm chilly. And then, ooh, my scales are fuzzy. I'm less chilly. I have more offspring. Right? <coughs> and so forth through time. And so you get these fuzzy scales that become feathers, and eventually you start getting, you know, asymmetries that work better for flight surfaces. Okay? So so feathers for flight are an acceptation from feathers for installation. Another way to fail the class. Um, advanced and primitive. Right? So we've all watched nature documentaries like the sea cucumber is the most primitive organism. Right? <coughs> um, it's been evolving for as long as you have. Right? It might not change as much as you have. It's been evolving for as long. Okay? Um, so this sort of Polarization, it's called cool Wikipedia GIF of you know, you know see things going back in time. Well actually all these ones are things living today. Right? 
So it's not like they're more prudent or advanced if you're all doing today. Oftentimes we see things like this, right? So here's a tree, and here's a bacterium, and other sort of less and less primitive organisms leading to us, right? And so people might see a tree like this and assume whatever's on this point is the most advanced. You might say, you might call these basal taxa, things like that. They are not bad term. They didn't involve them for the everything else. They normally could have the ancestral state in this space. Okay. <coughs> and in fact, I can do a different tree. Right? There's another tree. Right? Also valid phylogeny. Right? Vertebrate's sister to um, arthropods. Right? Leading up to those advanced attacks on a cockroach. So in one tree, you know, humans were advanced, in the tree, humans are basal, right? The same overall tree, right? So the text saying advanced, basal, that's what gives you no information. It just, it just tends to mislead you. So you might think, oh, so the ancestral, that's what it was recent, you know, had beards. No, probably not. You know, he had the beard, that's obviously the, the ancestral trait. Okay? <coughs> now we can't say they probably had bilateral symmetry, so at least a bilateral symmetry. So don't look at a tree and try to figure out, you know, which ancestor is closest to the root, because okay? they're all equal aged. If they're not to equal age, you know, let's say this were a T-Rex, which is back here, right here, right? It doesn't give you a lot of information about it being close, close to the root, unless you get really, really close. All right? And topology alone doesn't tell you that. Any questions about that? I forgot to mention that we were back at the um, speciation set of all the different definitions of speciation. You saw the A, B, C, D. So that'd be a clicker, clicker question. So I'd say, which do you believe is the definition of speciation? And so I'll press a button. And then I would give you two points in the web request. Okay. So if it's that sort of question, you get two points for being here. There's a question of, you know, what's the basal species? And you say, there are no basal species. Question A, or the basal species is a primitive species. You know, if you press A, you get two points. B, you get one point. If you weren't here, you get zero points. That's really great. Any questions? All right. See you on Friday.